Hey again, everyone. Wow, what a book. Jeremiah, such a rich book. If you're anything like me, prophets is probably one of the hardest ones to understand. And that's why I'm so thankful for the body of Christ that I have friends like Jordan that has spent hours and hours and hours of study. And it can help us to unlock more of those treasures and understanding of how this book come together. This collection of writings, of uh, prophecies and words of the Lord through the prophet Jeremiah. And that's where our key verse comes from as well, from this book. So the principle that I'd like to highlight on this session before we meditate, which I think it, it's, it's perfect for us to see how it plays out. This, that's one of, probably one of the best books on the best passage that we can explore a bit more of this principle. Is this um, approach that we've been talking about that we need to both study and meditate on the word. I wanted to, to bring that a little bit more together. We talked about that importance, um, and I think we can explore that a little bit more as we meditate on this passage uh, in a minute. I have no doubt that God can highlight, as you just, if you put your focus on, on a certain passage of this book, I have no doubt that God can speak to us, that the Spirit can reveal amazing, truthful, awesome things that we can apply in our lives. But unless we fully understand what is the whole message, we will be quite limited to, um, to what else can come out out of our reading through the book if we do not spend appropriate time to study and understand this book. Now, to study and meditate sometimes feels like a tension, right? Like it's, we often, when you hear people talking about it, it feels like one uh, uh, is more guarding this. You can only get to the truth if you go through this channel, through this pathway, and now there seems to be a bit more just zoom in on the Word of God, just allow the Spirit to speak to us. And I'd like to suggest that studying meditation is a lot more complementary to each other rather than being opposite strengths in attention. Okay, so first of all, meditation is not the same as taking words out of context. Okay, meditation is, it, it is about going deeper on a certain passage. It is about allowing the Spirit to speak to us as we take the time to, to read and to meditate, but you're not ignoring the context that that, that passage or that those words or those sentences are spoken into. You should actually, in fact, uh, search and inquire more of what is actually going on in Scripture so that we can get into the real depths of it. But there, that's, that's not ignoring what it is. Unfortunately, it is. There's a lot of uh, 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 teachings and preachings that has been misleading into not really what the word is supposed to mean. But I don't think that's because the word taking or, or missing the context was more like ignoring the context where they came from. Because the truth is that if our hearts is not willing to, to change, if not willing to to, to let the Word shape our lives, it doesn't matter how much context we can get, we're always going to find a way to resist it anyways. So we need to approach, that's why we need to approach the Word of God with this hunger, with this willingness to, to haga over it, so that we can um, let it transform our lives and let our lives be shaped by it. Okay, so I would like to talk a little bit more about this tension. How do we deal with this apparent tension of meditation and study? Okay, the first thing, is um, we should approach it with a hunger to learn and trust the Holy Spirit. I think that's the main difference over here. You're not, you're not trying to build a theology for yourself. You're not trying to uh, just understand things for yourself from, from the out of context verse, but you're trusting that the Spirit is speaking to you. God is a good God. And if you come with him with an open heart, with a hungry heart, that truly want to learn, I doubt it that he is going to mislead us into partial truths or missing truths. Okay, so that's, that's the first thing is that let's not approach with fear that we're going to get something wrong, that we're going to do something wrong, but rather trust the Holy Spirit that he will lead us into that. Okay, and then the second thing is that uh, we must, like, like we've been saying, we must to... To, we must approach that with a sincere heart. We must approach, approach the word as we meditate 
with a sincere, honest, wanting to learn heart. Yes, the heart is deceitful, but you don't cure the deception of the heart by building strict boundaries, by saying this is the only way I can study the Word. You cure it by surrendering to the Lord and by having this sincere willingness to learn, to change, to be transformed before Him. The living Word of God, the Holy Spirit of God, and a sincere heart that is hungry to learn, these are perfect ingredients for us to grow into the knowledge of God through the Word. There is no way of going wrong with that. Like I said, the main problem is that unfortunate, a lot of those misconceptions that come um, through teachings that are out of context, they are intentionally ignoring the truth. It's, it's when you go to the scripture to try to validate a way of life, something that you don't want to open hand, you're going to get to a very different result than if you go to scriptures because you are hungry and you accept that that is a life that God wants to impart into you, and you are hungry for this life and willing to surrender your life to change. So that's a very key factor. If you approach with this heart, I, I you start to see that there is very little, uh, the tension between studying and meditation is, is starting to fade away. Because if you do approach the, the, this, if I don't fully understand the context, but I'm hungry to learn, that will lead me to want to understand more. That will lead me to want to, to have more uh, knowledge, and that should lead me to study the Word more so that I can understand what is the full message that is speaking to me over here. The same way that if you're studying with that hunger, with that spirit of wanting to learn, um, and you're starting to get this whole context and understanding of what the book is all about, you will want to go deeper. So meditation and study should actually feed from each other rather than feel like a tension that separates from each other. And for me, the trust in the Holy Spirit and that developing the sincere, hungry heart are very key uh, principles for us to eliminate this tension and start to embrace more of it. So for our example, we're going to highlight a, a classic, a classic verse that we hear a lot. And unfortunately, we hear a lot in the context of uh, a misconception or misleading truth if you can call it that. So that's the verse 11 from Jeremiah 29, verse 11. We all know, have heard that, have seen that in a plaque somewhere in somebody's house, when God says to the people of Israel, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and I hope. And I hope. What a truth. This is amazing. That's incredible blessings that's come out of here. But how can this turn into a misconception when you harden your heart? Well, uh, we see that a lot in prosperity theology, for example. If, if you have this idea that, you know, life of God is all about receiving blessings, of course, your eyes is going to immediately focus on, thus is the Lord, that He has thousands of a prosperous life. You know, or if you're have this misconception in your life where you feel like nothing wrong should go into your life because the life of God is about only blessings and, and there's nothing that can go possible wrong. So when you hear He's saying that His plans is plans, not a plans of evil, but plans of good future and a future of hope, you can be misled to this understanding that everything that's going wrong in your life is not from God. You know? And then yeah, I don't think that God necessarily put wrong things in our lives, but we can miss out as we start to understand the context of this, this letter, this word of the Lord to the people of Israel. We realize that we can actually miss out in the blessings if we come up with this understanding that nothing wrong can happen to us. So, if we just zoom in with that with a pure heart, okay, if I just want to learn from the Lord, I just want the Spirit to speak to me, and you look into this verse, there is an incredible promise here for us today. Yes. But I, I wanted to, the reason that I wanted to use this chapter as an example, or this passage as an example, is, is for us to see the depths of the meaning that we gain when we start to understand the context that is around this declaration of truth. So first of all, let's just read that again. Okay? Let's just read it again and, and listen to the promise of, of the Lord over your life. It says, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, 
says the Lord. Vows of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. That is an incredible promise. God thinks of us. He has plans for great future and for a hope. He is the one who knows these plans. So what am I hearing in the spirit when I read that? That he is the one I should go to, to hear his plans to my life. I'm not hearing that everything is going to be okay and that he, he's going to pour out a bunch of blessings in my life. He might do that too. But the promise that I hear only in these words, as I allow the Spirit to speak, is that He is the one who knows the plans that He has for my life. And they are plans not of evil, they are for a good future and hope. Now let's contextualize that a little bit more. Okay, let's see, let's, let's put this promise into context, in the context of this chapter only. Okay, as we as I believe you have, and Jordan has led to understand what's going on around those verses, uh, you notice that Israel is in exile. They're in a land not of their own. Okay, they are uh, gone out of their land, out of Jerusalem, and there is some false teachers that has been uh, trying to convince the people that not to listen to Jeremiah, who has been telling them that they should settle down, you know, there is a word of God, even in this, it's repeated a few times, even in this verse, it says again, that the Lord is saying that we should settle down. It's not our time to leave. Let's make a life here. Let's settle while we are in exile. And He will bless us as we do that. And as we seek the well-being of the city where we are in, we will then be blessed also. So let's, let's not go further in the context, just in, just in that. So the, there are other prophets that are saying, no, this is not true. That cannot be true because we don't belong here. We belong somewhere else. We should, it sounds familiar, right? We should go back to Jerusalem. That is our place of blessing. That's where we should go. Let's not listen to Jeremiah. And then Jeremiah rebooked the word and then he says, this is what the Lord says. I know the thoughts that I think towards you. They are not to harm you. They are plans of a good future and a good hope. Then you will call, and then he keeps going and saying, Then you will call upon me, and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me, and you find me, when you seek me with all your heart. So yes, God is the one who knows the plans. For us. So how, how do we apply that, this promise to our lives today in the understanding of this context? That sometimes we can be in tough situations. It might not be where we live, not might, be, might not be the, the place where God wants us to, that's not the most blessed place, that's not where the, the fullness of life it is, but for some reason, that's where we end up. But even while we are there, even we are, while we are wrestling through those times, God promises that He has good plans for us, that we can have hope, and that we ought to seek Him, and we will find Him when we seek Him with all of our hearts. Let's open up the context even more so. Why is Israel in exile in the first place? How did they get to that awful spot in their lives? We see it over a thousand years. There are some times of blessings, but over and over again, they were missing the point. They no longer know the Lord. They no longer obey the law. They no longer walk with the Lord. They worship idols. They give in to other cultures that involve all these bizarre practices that is completely against the value and what God is all about. So in order for them to realize how far they have gone, in order for them to be able to come back to God, God delivered them into exile. It's like, you want to keep living that way? Okay. Then they are conquered. They are taken away from their land. They live in exile. And now he's saying, you will be here a little bit longer, but while you're here, I have plans for your life. I am, you, you start to see this 
merciful, incredible, compassionate, and merciful, gracious heart of God through the hardship. It's like there was consequences of your mistakes, but don't worry, I am making a plan to restore you. I am making a plan to go to you. Just seek me. So I don't know, I don't know if you can follow what I'm trying to, to portray through, through this verse. We saw that the verse itself, the verse 11 itself, carries this incredible message, this incredible promise that it is not just for the people of Israel back then, but it's, this is who God is. He has his thoughts and plans for our lives. We can grab a hold of that right now. But as we start to understand the circumstances that, that those promises were made to them, and we start to think of situations in our life, say, wait a second, this, this is not just a plan, this is not just a promise of blessings coming in, but this is a reminder that no matter how messy our life can be, no matter how far we can go, God will always make a plan, always make a way to restore us. And He is inviting us to seek Him. And He promised that if we seek Him with all our heart, we will find Him. So on itself, this is an incredible promise. But we, when you understand the depths of where these words were spoken into, you can take to even deeper circumstances and troubles that we go through on our lives. This is the, the incredible beauty of this blend together. And that's something that we try to do through this seminar of blending, uh, fading away this tension between studying and meditation. Meditating is not taking the verse out of context, it's just going deeper on it. But as we understand more what the Word is saying, as we have the context of where we are at, the depth of the meaning, the impact of the revelation that God brings to us is so much bigger. Now, the beauty of it is that whatever our le level of knowledge is, God will continue to build on it. And as we meditate and as we receive this revelation, um, that will stir up this hunger to know more. And as we know more, that should stir up this hunger to go deeper in it and to allow this life to come into us. So that is the beauty of both study and meditating, how they blend beautifully together. So for our assignment, to, um, I would like to suggest that we just go a little bit deeper on this passage. Okay, look through your notes, look through the, the, the context that you have been studying. You, can, you know by now, um, as you have following the sessions and got to this point, well done, by the way, really good. Um, just like glance through it, go back to your notes, what God has been highlighting to you through your study, and then con contextualize this passage a bit more. So the passage that we're going to highlight for our assignment is Jeremiah 9, 4, verse 4 to 14. And this is actually look like one letter, but there is, uh, I think, three letters together. Uh, but so we're just going to focus on this portion, okay, from verse 4 to 14. And as you do that, go deeper with the Lord and try to understand not only what He is saying on those particular verses, but try to, to see this, this um, dynamic of how revelations get deeper, how the meaning of what is burning get deeper as you contextualize what is happening as well. Okay, so apply the principles that we've been talking to, take time to reflect, to ponder, and let God's amazing wisdom be revealed to you as you go deeper and zoom in into those verses. All right, have fun, and I'll see you again in our next session.